Hello, this tutorial is being given as part of the NT21 conference hosted by Rice University. Uh, so I'm Mike Arnold. I teach and have a research group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Uh, so this tutorial's topic is carbon nanotube electronics. Uh, so the tutorial is divided into four parts. Uh, first, there's a look uh, at opportunities and challenges in carbon nanotube electronics. And, uh, try to convince you that nanotube electronics is an exciting, promising area, um, but there are still uh, sizable challenges uh, remaining. Uh, then, in the second part of the tutorial, we'll take a look at how does a nanotube field effect transistor work. We're going to start at a very uh, simple level that everyone can hopefully uh, understand, um, even if you don't have a background in semiconductors. Uh, and then we'll work up to a more intermediate view description of a carbon nanotube transistor uh, and we will not get into very advanced topics in this tutorial. Uh, third is we'll look uh, at literature, at state of the arts, and the different type of work on ongoing in this field. Uh, and we'll conclude then with a perspective on fundamental research needed to translate nanotube electronics from a more fundamental um, type of research into uh, a commercially viable um, um, thing. All right, so let's start off by looking at opportunities and challenges with the carbon nanotube electronics. Um, to start, I want to say that uh, nanotube electronics might have a very different meaning to very different people. Uh, so the, um, the type of device you might read about or that you might be studying yourself uh, might influence what you think carbon nanotube electronics means. Uh, so there are many different types of devices. For example, there are transparent electrodes um, where um, maybe this is a silicon solar cell with nanotubes on top of it, um, where the nanotubes are letting light through but collecting the charge. Um, this is not using necessarily the semiconducting nature of the nanotubes, um, but it's a use of nanotubes and electronics nonetheless. Uh, and then there are other types of, of devices or electronics that use semiconducting nanotubes uh, as really the, the workhorse of the device, the workhorse semiconductor of the device. And those might include diodes um, or light emitting or light detecting devices um, or sensors, for example, biosensor. Uh, or a field effect transistor, and this is likely a device that most people will picture in their minds. I'm going to spend the most time talking about uh, field effect transistors in this tutorial. Uh, and then lastly, circuits and systems of all of the above. Uh, so the um, other thing to think about as we start in this tutorial is that the materials um, of, that are one might consider to be nan a nanotube um, vary considerably. Um, so they vary in the, both their microstructure and maybe their composition. Um, so here's a look at two different structures of nanotube-based materials. We have a single nanotube in a transistor okay, on the left. And on the right, we have many nanotubes in what's called a network. Um, so the structure of how many nanotubes there are, the morphology of how those nanotubes integrate together, uh, will vary from study to study and from processing approach to processing approach. And furthermore, uh, the structure of the individual nanotubes might differ from nanotube to nanotube. The diameter and what's called the chiral angle uh, will differ um, as well. And so there's no such thing as a carbon nanotube uh, material that is always the same. There are uh, large differences in what we consider to be uh, carbon nanotube materials from study to study, from group to group, and from application to application. Um, so the um, individual nanotubes uh, differ in their structure. And so uh, what's shown here are uh, five different structures of nanotubes, and uh, they're to scale, and they're given by what's called their NM chiral indices here. And if you look at these nanotubes, you see that well, they all look pretty similar in diameter, but they differ a little bit. So this one um, on the far left is a 6.5. It has 7.57 angstrom diameter. The one on the far right is the 7.5. It has 8.29 um, angstrom diameter. And uh, I draw your attention to the comparison between these two nanotubes on the right here. They differ in their um, size by only four picometers. Okay, so we're talking tiny, tiny differences in structure. And what's really interesting is that this 6.6 six nanotube is a metallic nanotube, whereas this 7.5 five nanotube is a semiconducting nanotube. So that small differences in the structure of a nanotube can result in large differences in their electronic properties. And to date, there are no um, methods for synthesizing a pure sample of nanotubes. It's just one um, in, in covariality of nanotube. 
Uh, so typically, uh, the most simplest synthesis will result in two thirds of the nanotubes that are grown in a mixture of nanotubes that are, are semiconducting type, and one third are metallic. Uh, and advances in post synthetically sorting those nanotubes have been critical in producing populations of nanotubes that are all are, are 99.9 .9 or 99.999 percent semiconducting. Uh, and likewise, there have been significant advances in the synthesis, the direct synthesis of mostly semiconducting nanotubes. Um, but the field still has a lot more to go in terms of being able to produce specific types of nanotubes on demand. And that will be an important part of commercializing nanotubes ultimately as well. Um, so in addition to the structure of nanotubes being different and there being different types of devices, it's also important to realize that a device is defined not just by the nanotube, but how it interfaces with the other components of that device. So for example, in this field effect transistor, the nanotube needs to make contact with the uh, electrodes. Uh, and so the um, interface between the usually metal electrode and the nanotube is very important. And likewise, the nanotube needs to make contact with, in this case, a dielectric, a hafnium oxide dielectric in this case. And the quality and uh, um, cleanliness of those interfaces um, are also very important in dictating the properties of devices. <clears throat> All right, so why care about nanotube electronics? Um, so nanotubes truly do have exceptional properties. Charges move through nanotubes extraordinarily well. Um, if you have um, a larger device, maybe where the length scale in which the charges have to move through nanotubes is several hundred nanometers or more, then the metric you want to use to characterize how well charges move through a nanotube is called the charge transfer mobility. Uh, and the mobility can be more than 10,000 centimeters squared per volt seconds. Compared to uh, the mobility in silicon, it might be on the order of 1,000 centimeters squared per volt seconds. If you have a much smaller device um, where the electrons aren't traveling quite as far, then a different um, number becomes uh, um, the most important for characterizing how well charges can move through a nanotube. And that's the thermal velocity uh, of, of charges. And that is also very high in carbon nanotubes. Uh, in addition to how well charges move through nanotubes um, uh, as being an, an important advantage that they offer, their wire-like geometry um, is also very um, critical uh, and a big advantage. Um, so unlike 2D materials or 3D materials, a 1D material that's a wire uh, with a wire-like structure is able to direct the flow of electricity from one point to another. That's really unlike any other form of matter. And the one-dimensional structure of nanotubes uh, gives them what's called one-dimensional electrostatics, which makes it easier to switch uh, a nanotube between conducting and insulating states. And uh, nanotubes are what's called the, uh, or what I call the ideal fins. Um, so silicon, if you follow the silicon microelectronics field, um, silicon transistors are made using fins of silicon. And the nanotube is really the, uh, essent the quintessential fin. It is um, self-defined in, in, in nanoscale size, uh, and it has no dangling bonds along its surface. Um, so uh, beyond the electronic advantages that nanotubes offer, and they also offer a really unique processing advantages. So you could deposit nanotubes onto substrates uh, via solution processing at uh, temperatures near room temperature uh, or at room temperature. And this is really important because it allows you to build up um, nanotubes um, or deposit nanotubes on top of existing circuits of nanotubes without thermally degrading those underlying circuits. And this is very difficult to do monolithically with single crystal silicon because of the high melting point and high processing temperatures needed to, to create single crystal silicon. So nanotubes offer unique um, materials processing advantages that aren't possible with silicon. Uh, uh, you can also grow carbon nanotubes on other substrates without the lattice matching constraints that uh, oftentimes um, limit um, the ability to grow one semiconductor on top of another. Um, I'm talking about conventional semiconductors here without, uh, for example, um, dislocations um, or other defects that result from lattice matching um, um, problems. Uh, mechanically, carbon nanotubes are very resilient materials, and this is very distinct from, say, silicon or indium tenoxide or other uh, more brittle uh, conventional semiconductors. And this enables applications that aren't possible conventionally in, in flexible and stretchable electronics. All right, so uh, nanotube electronics are pretty exciting materials um, and with really amazing uh, properties, and there's been a lot of hype surrounding them in literature. But uh, are they overhyped, for example, uh, possibly? Uh, I argue no. Um, so the performance gains that carbon nanotubes offer are real. Uh, this is not just theory that they should be better materials, but, uh, but backed up by real experiments with real data. 
And realistically, nanotubes are expected to outperform monocrystalline silicon and field effect transistors for logic applications. And this is due to nanotubes' excellent charge transport properties and their 1D electrostatics. Uh, and this should um, allow for uh, five times more current um, or per transistor per width or two to ten times lower power consumption. And uh, so you could run your circuit and do more computations per second as the result with the same power consumption, or you could run the same number of computations per second with, um, with using less power and allowing your battery to last longer. Uh, these are projections based on extrapolation of single nanotube uh, experimental measurements, uh, extrapolated to arrays of multiple nanotubes per transistor. Uh, so they're, they're fairly realistic projections, uh, providing that uh, aligned arrays of nanotubes can be fabricated um, reliably. Um, that's considering a single layer of nanotubes in a transistor. If you have multiple layers of, of nanotubes integrated in the same circuit, then the potential gains in terms of power consumption or computations um, per minute or per second are, are even greater, substantially greater. Um, nanotubes are also expected to outmatch the speed, linearity, and data throughput that's possible in radio frequency devices for low noise amplifiers and circuits of importance for communications technology. Um, and in the area of macroelectronics or printed or stretchable electronics, um, nanotubes really uh, outcompete by a large margin current state of the art materials such as amorphous silicon um, or uh, amorphous oxide semiconductors uh, due to their high charge transport mobility, even when they're in thin film form. So the charge transport mobility that I mentioned earlier, uh, that's really a number that is characterizing the charge transport in individual nanotubes. When you have a network of nanotubes, you're really limited by the tube-tube um, contacts, um, but even with that limitation, nanotubes uh, networks are really exceptional charge transport materials. Um, so the nanotube um, electronics are not overhyped, if you ask me, um, and this is because there are real experimental data showing uh, that the performance gains are, are real. Um, so to the last several, several slides um, cite 16 different references, and if you'd like to dig further into these references, they're listed um, here. You could take a snapshot of this screen. All right, so if the, if the nanotubes really offer such um, um, enticing performance advantages, then what's holding the field back? Uh, it, in my opinion, the biggest thing holding the field back is materials and processing challenges. Um, so we need to be able to create uh, exceptionally uniform and reproducible network thin films of nanotubes, individually placed nanotubes, aligned regular arrays of nanotubes um, with excellence, um, homogeneity and structure and electronic properties. Uh, and we need to be able to uniformly and reproducibly integrate these nanotubes with, uh, with very clean interfaces or very well controlled interfaces with other materials. And we need to be able to sort through all these challenges to create transistors and circuits with very high yield and extremely reproducible characteristics. And that's really not a point the field is at quite yet. So the competition, at least in very high performance electronic space um, for logic, um, is uh, the single crystal silicon wafer. And so if you look at these wafers here, they are um, very reproducible. They're monolithic, uniform, reproducible, almost perfect starting points for creating whatever type of device you want. And so what we need to be able to do in this field to provide a little bit of perspective now is we need to be able to create the equivalent of this silicon wafer, but from carbon nanotubes. So we need films, networks, arrays, et cetera, of nanotubes with the uniformity and reproducibility of silicon and other conventional electronic materials. Um, so this is, uh, is kind of the big picture of what needs to happen in the carbon nanotube field to really push it towards commercialization. And I give you this big picture now before we start so that we can um, uh, have in our minds kind of the important challenges moving forward as we look at what's kind of been done in the past. So moving on to uh, part two of the tutorial, we're going to look at how does a nanotube field effect transistor work. Um, so to make this tutorial as accessible as possible uh, to as many people as possible, knowing that the nanotube community comes um, comes into the conference with many different backgrounds, and uh, these backgrounds may be in chemistry, biology, material science, uh, electrical engineering, physics, uh, biological. Um, I, to make the tutorial as accessible as possible for even those who haven't had a background in semiconductors, we're going to start by talking about uh, some of the basic concepts underpinning semiconductors, such as what is a semiconductor, uh, 
Uh, what is a band gap? How do you control the conductivity of a semiconductor and how do charges move through the semiconductor? So we're going to look at these uh, aspects and then we're going to use these aspects to understand uh, and start to piece together how a carbon nanotube transistor might work. All right, so uh, a semiconductor is, is able to act and dynamically switch between acting like a conductor and uh, an insulator. Uh, so a semiconductor can be doped to conduct negative charge uh, when it is in the conducting state or to conduct positive charge when it's in the conducting state. And that's the conduction of what's called holes in a semiconductor. And an important um, parameter describing a semiconductor, semiconductor is called the band gap or the energy gap. Um, so we know materials like copper, shown in the lower left, and, and quartz, shown in the lower right, are, are conducting and insulating respectively. So a semiconductor can effectively switch between conducting and insulating like materials on uh, in ultra-fast timescales. Uh, so let's start off by talking about a band gap. Uh, and we can understand the band gap from the most basic level by starting with description of the energy level of um, electrons in isolated atoms. So we could look at kind of a high school chemistry picture of um, an atom. We have a positively charged nucleus, and we have these different shells, and we have the electrons kind of uh, orbiting these shells. And depending on how close the electron is, which shell the electron is in, uh, the energy level will vary. So the electrons that are the closest to the nucleus, that's the n um, equals 1 shell. And then the next shell out is the n equals 2, and those are at higher energy levels. So to kick an electron from the first shell to the second shell would require that much energy. So uh, this picture um, describes an individual atom. But what happens when we pack together multiple, um, multiple atoms into a material? All right, so when you have, um, right, so we're gonna, look, uh, we're gonna look at just the first shell energy level right now. So we have one energy level, the first shell, and when we have one atom, we have one energy level. And then when you have two atoms, um, these electrons in both the first shells of the atoms um, might overlap a little bit. And this overlap causes a splitting of the one energy level into two. And when you have three atoms, the splitting will form three levels. When you have four atoms, you'll get four levels. And when you have many, many, many atoms, then the energy levels will split into many, many, many discrete levels that are so finely spaced that you have effectively what's called a band of energies. And all materials, semiconductors, metals, insulators have, uh, that are crystalline will have bands. And a semiconductor um, has a special configuration of bands that's different than that of a, of a metal. And so to understand that, uh, this picture here shows that, well, if you have this splitting occurring for the different shells of electrons, and if we look at not just the n equals 1, but also the n equals 2 and the n equals 3, and if we were also to look at the s, p, d orbitals, and we're also to consider maybe they might hybridize. Um, for example, we know in carbon that there's a sp2 hybridization. Um, once you consider that, you'll, you'll still have isolated energy levels in atoms, and they'll split into multiple bands in your solid. And then you start filling in those bands with how many electrons you know you have in your material. And if you get a situation where um, the topmost band, which contains electrons, the topmost field, uh, it's completely filled, like shown here, and the next band up is completely empty, then you uh, form what's called a band gap. And the energy difference between the filled band and the empty band, you know, that's the band gap, it's measured in units of energy. Um, so only some of our carbon nanotubes are semiconductors with this band gap. And these are the nanotubes with chiral vectors specified by N and M here in the pink uh, and blue. Those are the semiconductors. Um, so what's shown here is a sheet of graphene, and there's a vector going from 0, 0 to n, comma n, n, comma m, um, where you have n steps of a1 and m steps of a2 to compose the chiral vector. If you take that sheet and you wrap it up into a cylinder, you then get a carbon nanotube where that chiral vector C becomes the circumference of the nanotube. So the pink and blue nanotubes, those are uh, those are semiconductors, and the green ones end up being uh, metallic, in which there's no gap here in the, the band structure. All right, so uh, among the semiconducting ones, the band gap varies inversely with, with diameter. So the uh, blue here is experimentally measured data of how the optical band gap, optically measured band gap, 
varies inversely with nanotube diameter. Now the electrical band gap is going to be uh, a few tens of MeV larger than the uh, optically measured band gap here, or even maybe even a few hundreds of milli electron volts larger. Uh, so a deeper picture, um, if you want to go deeper than this, um, you need to um, go a little bit deeper in the theory and look at how the energy of electrons in solids vary not um, only in that simple picture we discussed, but also as a function of the um, direction the electron is heading in the material and its, and its wavelength in the material, which is given by the wave vector k here. So the wave vector is roughly inversely proportional to the wavelength, and the direction the electron is going is, in, is, is parallel to the direction of the wave vector. Uh, and so what's shown in the lower, on the lower left here uh, are the um, conduction, um, that's up here, the conduction and the valence bands of graphene. And you can see that they touch at, at six points. And that makes graphene a, uh, more metallic-like. Uh, if you have a carbon nanotube, and you roll up your carbon nanotube um, so that that chiral vector becomes a circumference, then the electrons in the nanotube can only exist at certain wave vector k. Um, and that's shown here by these red lines. And if one of those red lines intersects the um, one of those k points where the conduction valence bands of graphene touch, then that nanotube ends up being metallic. And if it doesn't touch, then it ends up being semiconducting. And then from, uh, from this exercise, you could extract the energy versus wave vector of, a, uh, of electrons in a carbon nanotube. And you could uh, extract the band gap. Uh, so this, this reference here in the lower left, um, Physical Properties of Carbon Nanotubes by Saito, Dresselhaus, and Dresselhaus is a really well-written reference that will walk you through step-by-step step how to calculate uh, the energy versus wave vector. Um, uh, dispersion is what it's called for a carbon nanotube uh, of any N M from that of graphene. It's really a, a really well-written um, textbook. All right, so that is what a semiconductor is. It's essential to most of the electronic devices that we care about in carbon nanotube electronics. Uh, so next, how to control the conductivity of a semiconductor. Um, so a semiconductor that has a band gap that's much more than KT, um, like this one shown here, um, which has, will have an empty conduction band and a full, uh, full valence band. Um, and it will act like an insulator. And uh, that's because there are no um, holes in the, in, the, in the field valence band for, for there to be a net transport of charge and there's no electrons in the conduction band. Um, if you add an electron to the conduction band, then the conductivity of the semiconductor will increase. And likewise, if you take away an electron from the valence band, that leaves effectively what's uh, a positive charge, which is called a hole. That will also increase the conductivity of a semiconductor. All right, so how do we um, control the conductivity by adding or removing charge on demand in the semiconductor? Uh, and the, the trick uh, in, a, in a device like a field effect transistor is to use capacitance. All right, so what does that mean? So if you have two conductors or a conductor and a semiconductor separated by an insulator, and you apply a voltage between them, um, depicted here by this battery, um, then you will get charge that builds up on the interfaces of the electrode of the insulator and the interface between the nanotube and the insulator. And the amount of charge that builds up, Q, is equal to capacitance times the voltage you've applied. So the more voltage you apply across your capacitor, the more charge you'll get that builds up in your carbon nanotube. And the amount of capacitance varies inversely with the distance between the electrode and the nanotube, and it will vary with the dielectric, per, dielectric or the relative permittivity of uh, that insulator. Now, when you add electrons to the nanotube, you're putting them in the, uh, the conduction bands. So you're increasing the conductivity of that nanotube via capacitance. Uh, likewise, if you flip that battery around, um, then you'd get positive charge in your nanotube and you'd get negative charge in your electrode. And that would positive charge would reside in the, uh, the top of the valence band. Uh, photons are another way to generate mobile charges in a semiconductor. Um, so the photon, if the energy matches the band gap, uh, then it could kick up an electron 
um, from the field band to the empty band, then from the valence to the conduction band, leaving a hole in a, an electron in those two bands, which can uh, increase those conductivity uh, if, if you could disentangle them from one another. Um, so they are attracted to each other in a carbon nanotube by uh, uh, Coulomb forces. Um, so if you have charge in a nanotube, how does it flow? Um, so if you connect a battery along the length of the nanotube, like the, so you apply a larger voltage to one side of the nanotube versus the other, the charges will move. All right, so the electrical current, I, uh, is characterizing how much charge is flowing. It's the number of electrons that flow past a certain point um, per time. So we could like say, I'm going to measure through this red line here, how many electrons per time pass through this point. And you multiply that by the charge per electron, and then you get uh, the electrical current. Uh, and electrical current is simply measured in, in amperes or amps. And one ampere is 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second flowing past a, a given point. All right, so let's now look at one individual charge at a time. All right, so we have this one hole. And then let's say we apply a uh, voltage. So the charge wants to move um, from the, toward the positive voltage towards the negative voltage. And it, it, let's say it's initially uh, on average at rest, and then you apply voltage on average, it's going to start increasing in its velocity uh, more and more. So its velocity will increase with time. Uh, if you think about this you know, classically, you apply a force, which results in acceleration, which results in increasing velocity per time. But eventually, the electron will scatter off a um, maybe another electron in your material or off an atom um, in the nanotube, uh, which are vibe or uh, or a vibration of the atoms can cause the scattering of the electron. There could be a defect in the material. And the distance between the um, where the scattering occurs, um, the start point and the, and, the, and the end point of the scattering, so the characteristic scattering length is called the mean free path. And then once the electron loses momentum from scattering, it'll start moving again. And this scattering, by the way, moving backwards, adds electrical resistance to your circuit. So the can, electrons uh, connect energy, uh, or in this case, the holes connect energy is lost to heat by the scattering. All right, so this mean free path is a really important um, parameter to, to keep in mind. And so there's two regimes of charge flow in the carbon nanotube. And uh, the first is called the drift diffusive scattering um, type regime of charge transport. And this occurs when the length that charges must transport in your semiconductor or in your carbon nanotube is much, much greater than the mean free path. And in this case, the time averaged velocity, so the, the, if you want to think about this classically, then the, the charge will accelerate, lose its speed, accelerate, lose its speed. If you average it to velocity over time, what you'd see is that the velocity, which is called the drift velocity, is linearly proportional to the electric field that you apply. And the electric field is, electric field is volts you apply per distance. And the proportionality constant between the two is called mobility. And we mentioned mobility already, as units of distance squared per volt per second. The other regime of, of charge transport is called the ballistic regime. And this is when the length scale over which charges must move in your semiconductor is much, much less than the mean free path. Now you have the unimpeded charges of um, flow of charges through your nanotube, and uh, you have no resistance um, due to the charge of the nanotube, a uh, flow of electron through or hole through your nanotube. All right, so the flow of charge in this diffusive res, um, drift regime we said that uh, electrical current with number of electrons times the charge per electron divided by time. So we could change this to now say the number of electrons per length times the length per time that a charge will move, which is velocity times charge per electron. And this velocity is just mobility times electric field. And so um, we get this equation then that electrical current is the number of charges, which we could control using a capacitor um, times the electric field times mobility times charge per electron. Now in this diffusive, that's in the diffusive regime. In the ballistic regime, um, since there's no resistance inside the nanotube, the electrical current is determined by how easy it is to get electrons into or out of the nanotube at the contacts. And there's a theoretical limit for how easy that can be. Um, and the highest possible current you get is um, um, dictated by what's called the quantum conductance, uh, which says that's the theoretical minimum of how easy it is to get a charge into your nanotube and out of your nanotube. Uh, so here's some examples from reported literature of measured mobilities in carbon nanotubes and, and measured mean free paths. 
Let's see, here's a paper where a nanotube grown by, that's very high quality nanotube grown by CBD, uh, uh, quite large band gap, and there, or it's quite large diameter, so therefore it's a fairly small band gap, um, uh, is, is between two electrodes on a, on a dielectric surface. And the field effect mobility here is measured as a function of temperature and as a function of what's called the gate voltage, which we'll get to later. Um, and at, at room temperature, the mobility um, is around 80,000 centimeters squared per volt second. And the mean free path is very long. It's like 2.9 microns and micrometers in this case. Um, here's another example with arrays of nanotubes. These are solution process nanotubes. Um, so there are more adsorbates on the surface of a nanotube and they've been undergone what's called an ultrasonication process. There might be more point defects along the length of the nanotube. Um, so the mobility is not as large here. It's uh, estimated between around 1,000 and 2,000 centimeters squared per volt seconds with a mean free path of uh, on the order of 50 um, nanometers. Uh, and then here is uh, reported mobility in the network of nanotubes. Um, and this is a paper specifically looking at um, networks with different mixtures of nanotubes where you have really small, larger band gap nanotubes, larger diameter nanotubes, and intermediate mixtures of the two. And the mobility is calculated as a function of this um, this fraction of the large and small diameter nanotubes and varies between around 15 to 30 centimeters squared per volt second. So the charge transfer mobility in a network is typically less than 100 centimeters squared per volt second. And this is because um, the movement of charge is now limited oftentimes by tube-tube contact resistance. Um, but it uh, could also be due to um, uh, resistance due to, to the short mean free path along the length of the individual nanotubes, depending on how those individual nanotubes have been processed. All right, so this section was supposed to be about how does the field effect transistor work? So let's keep proceeding through this section to understand this further. All right, so we will first look at um, a single nanotube transistor in the diffusive drift regime. So we said that when we have a nanotube and an electrode separated by an insulator and we apply a voltage between the two, well, first of all, there's no direct flow of electricity from the nanotube to the electrode through the insulator because the insulator is an insulator, it's non-conducting. Um, you get a buildup of charge on opposing interfaces of the electrode insulator interface and the nanotube uh, insulator interface. Uh, in your transistor, you then add contacts along the length of the nanotube. And then you also apply a voltage along the length of the nanotube, which is going to cause the flow of charge along the length of, of the nanotube. And so you have three uh, really electrodes or terminals in a field effect transistor. You have your electrode. Um, on the other side of your insulator, which is called your gate. You have um, then electrodes on the, both sides of the nanotube. Uh, one is called the drain and one is called the source. And the electrons or holes or whatever the, uh, the carrier is that's carrying charge will emerge from the source and then go down the drain, leave, leave your nanotube through the drain. So that's how you can differentiate the source and, and the drain. All right. So another way of, instead of drawing batteries, another way to show that you're applying a voltage to something is with this symbol in circuits. Uh, so it's showing as a positive voltage being applied on the positive side with respect to the negative side. And another way of doing it is if you could just say, we're going to apply potentially a separate voltage um, Vs, Vd, and Vg um, at our three terminals. All right, so let's look at the amount of electrical current that flows down the length of the nanotube versus the um, voltage we apply to the gate. And we're going to apply a small source drain voltage. Okay, so a small voltage between along the length of the nanotube. That's always going to be much less than that of the, the gate. Okay, now remember that we have um, this equation in this drift diffusion regime where the electrical current is depending on the number of electrons per length, um, which we could control with this capacitor, uh, and then also the electric field which we're going to control by how large of the voltage we apply between the source and drain on the electrodes divided by that distance. Okay, so we're going to use the gate to control the number of electrons per length. All right, so when we apply zero volts to the gate, then we have more or less no charge um, due to this capacitance effect built up in our nanotube, and we're going to have a very small current. So I'm showing the uh, data points now in, in red here. Now, if we apply a more negative voltage, um, to the gate, then we're going to get positive charge that builds up in our nanotube. And let me um, hide myself so you can see this graph a little bit better. And um, you get then the flow of those holes in the nanotube from the source to the drain. Um, so they'll be moving 
along this way. And the amount of current will depend on how many charges there are. So the, the current goes up. All right, so now if we apply even a larger gate voltage to our gate electrode, we'll have even more positive charge built up into our nanotube, and the currents will be even larger. Um, and there will be a, a linear regime where the amount of current is linearly proportional to how much gate voltage we apply. And likewise, we could reverse the polarity and we could apply positive voltage to the gate with respect to the source and drain. And now we'll get um, a um, current that's still positive, but that increases with increasing um, gate voltage. Um, so uh, in this branch of the curve, we have holes being conducted. And in this branch of the curve, we have electrons being conducted. Okay. So um, moving on, um, we can start to plug in numbers into our equation here. So the electrons per length, that's going to just be the capacitance times the gate voltage divided by the length. So remember, charge is capacitance times gate times voltage drop across the insulator and we just divide by length uh, and then we know that the uh, electric field if there's no voltage drop at the contacts at least the electric field is going to be um, the source drain voltage divided by length so we could plug those numbers in and we could see that the amount of current is just given by you know multiplying all this together and we could look at the what's called the transconductance which is the change in current between source and drain electrodes per gate voltage, and that will be equal to the slope of this line. And we know we could calculate we could calculate the capacitance. It just depends on dielectric constant and dimensions of our transistor. We, we know the L is just dimensions. We know how much force drain voltage we apply. We could measure the transconductance in order to determine mobility. So this is a very common experimental technique in the field, which is use the transconductance to determine the charge transport mobility. And once we know the transport mobility, we can compare it to maybe other devices people have made. We could make different network morphologies or different processing uh, histories of our nanotubes and, and study how those, how those things affect um, charge transport mobility. All right, so this is a very simple picture of how a transistor works, and it overlooks several complexities that are really important. And so now I'm gonna start to work you through some of the complexities here. All right, so what happens um, in, in practice is that oftentimes you'll have um, interface charge. And this is uh, charge that's trapped in at the interface between, for example, the nanotube and the dielectric. And um, this interface charge that's kind of trapped there is, is not mobile. It doesn't move from, um, from source to drain. But it still counts in terms of uh, adding up the total charge that's on both sides of our capacitor. So it means there's less charge um, and less conductivity in the nanotube if some of that positive charge is, is residing in our insulator. And what that does is it shifts the kind of this V that we've drawn before um, over. And the, the new uh, minimum current occurs at what's called the, the threshold voltage. And so different transistors might have different threshold voltages um, depending on how much charge is at the interface. And this interface charge may be permanently trapped um, in the, at the interface between the insulator and the nanotube, um, or maybe dynamic. And there may be um, charge traps where the, the charges in the nanotubes, the free carriers in the nanotubes, can fill those traps depending on the bias. And I'll mention uh, that can lead to hysteresis, and I'll mention that in a second. Another deviation from this simple picture is, is shown here, where we have a um, a nonlinear component to these current versus gate voltage plots where the mobility um, decreases um, as we add more and more um, holes or, or electron free carriers to our nanotube. And this results then in a nonlinear curve. Or um, we could have contact resistance. So we have a, a voltage drop at the contacts that ends up um, becoming more and more important as the um, conductivity of the nanotube increases as we add more charge, leading to this nonlinearity. So mobility with, that decreases with charge carrier concentration or contact resistance effects can lead to nonlinear current versus voltage plots, in which case you want to use the linear portion down here to measure charge transport mobility. Um, oftentimes what's observed in measurements, especially measurements conducted in air, is that the electron mobility is less than the whole mobility. Uh, and this is not an intrinsic uh, mobility um, problem. So the intrinsically electron and hole mobilities are very similar in nanotubes. 
um, but it's actually indicative of um, one of two things. One is that the contacts might allow holes through um, the interface between the contact of the nanotube much more easily than electrons. And therefore, you might just have less uh, current on the electron side simply because um, the, there's um, a large re electrical resistance at the contacts. Or you get a trapping of the electrons in, in this, these surface states of the insulator that I just mentioned. Another deviation from the simple picture, and this is also especially true for devices measured in air, um, with at least with an exposed nanotube dielectric interface that's exposed to air, is that you could get what's called hysteresis. And so you get a loop when you measure uh, current versus gate voltage. And the direction of the loop and the magnitude of the loop will really depend on the mechanism um, underpinning the hysteresis, which can differ. But one, um, one common uh, reason for this hysteresis is that, um, for example, when you go to positive voltage on the um, nanotube and you have electrons in the or positive voltage on the gate and you have negative voltage on the on the nanotube and then they have negative charge on the nanotube those electrons can um, then transiently transfer to the surface states in the oxide and be and shift the threshold voltage kind of temporarily and then those states will unfill when you go to negative gate voltage and then they'll refill when you go to positive gate voltage and you'll get this hysteresis, which is a you know, time varying shifting of the threshold voltage due to um, feeling a more emptying of surface states. Now there could also be mobile charges on the surface that aren't in the part of the nanotube, but they're just maybe ions um, that move away or towards the nanotube with depending on the gate voltage. And these effects can give rise to hysteresis. Uh, another deviation from this picture occurs when you don't have a small source strain bias, but you have a large source strain bias. And this is actually important because real circuits that are using transistors for logic will have, um, during the normal operation of the transistor, a large drain voltage that's applied similar in magnitude to the gate voltage. Uh, in this case, um, here's an example. Like, let's say we apply a, a one volt to the um, gate, and we apply one volt to the drain and zero volts to the source. Um, so then the voltage drop over here on the left is going to be you know, close to zero, small voltage drop. So we only have a small density of charge over here. The voltage drop on the right at the source, and we have a full volt voltage drop there, and, and therefore we have more charge. And so you don't necessarily have a uniform charge density along the length of your nanotube. This becomes important when measuring a different um, curve. So now we're looking at uh, currents versus um, the um, drain voltage that's being applied at um, different gate voltages. So we're varying the gate voltage here. And what you see is a linear regime and a nonlinear regime called the saturation regime. And the saturation regime is reached when, the, um, when this effect um, starts occurring. All right, so an even more nuanced view of a carbon nanotube transistor um, is is what we're going to look at next. All right, so we've been drawing these bands, uh, the valence bands and the conduction bands. Um, it's easier to just draw the band edges. So the lowermost edge of the conduction band is just um, given by EC, and the highest most uh, edge of the valence band here is given by um, EV. And um, in order to keep track of how much doping there is, we could use a, a, a parameter called the Fermi level, okay? And that's given by this dashed line here. And when we have a negatively doped or in-type semiconductor, the Fermi level is closer to the conduction band. And when we have a neutral material, Fermi level is halfway in between the conduction and valence band. And when we have a positively doped or P-type material, um, where P stands for positive, the Fermi level is closer to the valence band. All right, so Fermi levels in materials like to line up um, when, when materials are put into contact with each other. And so if we have a metal, which has a Fermi level shown on the left, and we have a our semiconductor nanotube that's maybe n-type doped on the right, and we bring them together, the Fermi levels will want to, to line up. But oftentimes, the Fermi level gets stuck or pinned um, at the contact, like it may be, maybe halfway between the conduction and valence bands in this particular drawing. And then you get what's called band bending, so that the Fermi levels can still line up, um, the Fermi level is still in the middle at the contact, it's pinned there, uh, and it's still near the conduction band over here. Um, so to satisfy all those things, the bands need to bend. And now, in order to get an electron into our 
nanotube from the metal, we have a barrier. And this is called a Schottky barrier. And in order to get the electron over the barrier, it has to overcome this energy difference. Um, or the electron needs to tunnel through the barrier. And so maybe it would part way up and then tunnel through. So this adds resistance uh, and leads to lower currents in uh, a nanotube field effect transistor. Um, so the, the magnitude of the, the height of the Schottky barrier um, won't vary uh, as very much with the applied gate voltage, but um, the thickness of the barrier, which is kind of very important in understanding how much tunneling there is, does. And so in this paper, it shows that the, um, the, it becomes easier and easier for electrons to tunnel through um, as we apply more and more gate voltage. So the injection of charge into a nanotube through a Schottky barrier really can dictate um, how much current um, will flow through a nanotube when that transistor is first switching from uh, an off state to an on state. And uh, the transition, yeah, so the transition between an on and off state and shock, shocky barrier, if we look at both now the conduction and valence bands is shown um, in, this, in this schematic here. Um, so in the off state, um, we have uh, barriers and it's very difficult for charges to, to tunnel through those barriers. In the on state here, this is the on state conduction for holes or positive charge, the barrier for holes to tunnel through into the valence band becomes thinner. So different electrode metals, um, which have different work functions, and therefore they form different heights of Schottky barriers with carbon nanotubes. Um, and also the band gap of the nanotube will affect the barrier height. Uh, so this paper here shows that um, in the field effect transistor, you get much more current using palladium contacts when you've applied a negative gate voltage here, which in which case you're putting holes in the nanotube. So you get much more hole conduction in your nanotube when you use palladium contacts than when you use titanium contacts than when you use aluminum contacts. And uh, this is because of the difference in work functions of those um, different uh, materials. And likewise, if you vary the band gap of your nanotube, then that will affect the amount of current as well. So here is comparing palladium contacts with titanium contacts with aluminum contacts for um, nanotubes of different diameters. As so you can see, as you go to smaller diameters to the right of this one over diameter uh, plot, you get lower and lower currents when you uh, are in the on state of the transistor. And the on state of the transistor is when you're applying a fairly large negative gate voltage to try to inject as much positive ch charge and charge carriers into the nanotube as possible. All right, so um, the other more nuanced analysis of a fuel effect transistor we need to make is to look at this transition between the on and off states. So we need to look more carefully and more closely at what's happening down here at very small currents uh, near, um, near the origin of this graph as drawn here. All right, so if you instead plot the log of current versus gate voltage, you'll see a plot that looks like this. And up here is the linear regime where the, where the conductivity, the amount of current that flows, depends on mobility um, and capacitance and gate voltage linearly. So on a log plot, it looks sublinear. But then you'll see an exponential regime that looks linear on the log plot. This is called the subthreshold regime. And the plot of the log of the current, or the derivative rather, of the log of the current with respect to gate voltage, that's the slope on this log linear plot. And if you take the inverse of that slope, that's called the subthreshold swing of your transistor, which is a very important parameter uh, in understanding how transistors, how well they switch between on and off states and how much voltage you need to do that. Okay, so you want as small as possible of a subthreshold sw swing in order to minimize the power consumption of a, of a logic transistor. Uh, a very good subthreshold swing is around uh, 60 millivolts per decade, which means that for every 60 millivolts of gate you apply, this way, if this is 60 MeV, then you'll change the current by a factor of 10. Uh, Schottky barriers and, and interfacial charge traps can both increase the subthreshold swing leading to um, degrade, uh, you know, poor performing transistors. So let's look at why a small subthreshold swing is important in, in a different way. So let's say that we have three different transistors that all have the same off currents when you have no voltage applied to the gate. And then you apply a constant gate voltage. And uh, usually the gate voltage, the, the maximum gate voltage you could apply in a logic transistor is, is determined by the supply voltage. And so that if that were to be fixed, then um, the device with the, uh, the largest subthreshold swing, so the, the worst subthreshold swing, uh, 
would only turn on with the smallest on current here. And the device with the steepest subthreshold characteristics, which have the smallest subthreshold swing, would have the most current. And more current allows for faster switching circuits as a lower RC uh, you know, time constant. Um, so the other way you could look at this is that to get the same amount of currents in this blue transistor, you'd have to go to much larger gate voltage and you'd use more power because power is current times voltage. All right, um, so well, one more thing we want to look at is a more nu nuanced view of what happens, um, not in the diffusive regime, but when your channel length is very short in a field effect transistor. Um, to understand nanoscale transistors, I recommend really looking on this resource here, nanohub.org. Um, there are a bunch of really great presentations and content by Mark Lundstrom of Purdue University. And this is uh, looking at one of uh, Mark's uh, papers uh, uh, at carrier transport in nanoscale uh, field effect transistors. Um, so in a nanoscale field effect transistor, it ends up that the, the current is determined by the amount of charge, which just depends on the capacitance and the gate voltage, and then a velocity, um, where this velocity is really depending on the thermal velocity. And what we're really looking at is in this regime right here, um, there's a pretty flat band, which means low electric field. And the transport of um, electrons over this, through this region, from the source over the, through this region, is really kind of the right limiting step in a nanoscale field effect transistor. So remember, in, in, when a channel length is really short, this scattering of electrons along the length is not, it's not what's dictating the properties. So we don't care about the mobility like we did in the diffusive regime. Instead, we care about the thermal velocity. Um, so uh, in this marked paper here, there's a quote that says, currents controlled by how rapidly carriers are transported across a short, low field region near the beginning of the channel. So we want a very large thermal uh, velocity uh, here. All right, so thermal velocity in nanotubes is estimated to be about 3.8 times 10 to the 7th centimeter squared per second versus silicon is around 1.35 times 10 to the 7th. Um, so yeah, so here is another example of where in the nanoscale um, uh, how carbon nanotubes offer uh, significant performance advantages, or at least the promise of that compared to silicon. All right, so moving beyond uh, single nanotube transistors um, towards arrays tra of, of transistors, um, we need in a, in a realistic uh, logic or RF, or, or RF circuit um, or um, application, you can't get away with just using one nanotube anymore. You need arrays of nanotubes. And this is just to get more current per uh, device. Okay, so you need more current compared to the parasitic capacitance um, or uh, resistances of your integrated circuit. Um, you can understand the um, current voltage characteristics, luckily, of a, an array transistor because it's just a superposition of the current from each individual nanotube. So more nanotubes means more currents. Um, but if you have too many nanotubes and they're all like jumbled up in the channel here and they're not evenly separated like shown in this cartoon, then you can actually get less current. And so there's a trade-off between how many nanotubes you have and how much current there is. So there's a trade-off between inter nanotube interactions and the, the fact that just having more nanotubes should result in more current. And the, um, the trade-off um, it's been estimated to be around, you want an ideal pitch of nanotubes of around five to 10 nanometers. So you want your nanotubes very regularly spaced at a pitch of around five to 10 nanometers between nanotubes. Um, also, if you have too many nanotubes, you could have, in addition to this inter-nanotube interactions, which are called crosstalk effects, you could also have uh, poor wetting of the nanotubes by the contacts. Um, so models, as I mentioned before, show that with an array of nanotubes with this pitch of around five to 10 nanotubes per um, or, uh, nanometers, between nanotubes, you should have five times the current density of silicon possible or two to 10 times lower power consumption at fixed, um, at fixed on currents. And likewise, in RF devices, um, you should be able to take them to higher frequency um, and have higher linearity compared to, for example, gallium arsenide in RF. And you should have enormous advantages if you compare an aligned array of nanotubes versus the performance of a, of a thin film transistor. Um, so in a, in a high-performance transistor, we, um, for logic, we need to cram as many transistors per area as possible. So we need to have very short channel length. But we also need to have very short contact length. And um, so shrinking contacts is an, also an important issue. And there's, there's um, a problem that happens with just evaporating metal um, over the top of a nanotube. 
which is that as you decrease the contact length of this, this dimension, the uh, contact resistance goes up. Um, so in this paper um, from IBM um, several years ago, they showed that by forming a metal carbide with the nanotube, so you have what's called an end contact, that as you shrink the contact length, you don't sacrifice um, the contact resistance. The contact resistance remains more or less constant. So this allows for um, good contact resistance at very, very small contact lengths, which is important for having very um, low area uh, footprint devices. Um, another uh, thing to consider is that you need transistors um, integrated together that both conduct holes and conduct electrons in order to make CMOS um, circuits and where C stands for complementary. Um, so in this nanotube microprocessor paper um, from two years ago, um, one of the key circuit elements was this inverter where there's um, nanotubes um, that in the on state they're conducting holes. Those are called PMOS transistors. And then there's nanotubes in the on state they're conducting electrons. And those are called NMOS transistors. And they work together to form an inverter where the output voltage is inverted from that, uh, the input voltage. Uh, and in order to make complementary transistors, what's uh, needed uh, is to use different contact materials um, that have different work functions. And so the work functions here of the platinum uh, better match that of the valence bands. So you have a smaller Schottky barrier to valence band, whereas the work function of the titanium better matches that of the conduction bands. So you could get more easily, um, more easily injection of, uh, of electrons. In the uh, next section of the, to the tutorial, we're going to examine uh, the different types of uh, electronic devices being explored in, li in literature, in the scientific literature. Uh, so this, this section of the tutorial is not meant to be a comprehensive um, review of um, uh, all the work going on. It definitely misses many groups' contributions. Um, it's, it's not meant to capture all the different groups working in the space. Rather, it's meant to capture the different types of devices and the different type of um, research directions going on in the field. Um, so, um, so first of all, the field um, has been very active for 20 plus years. Um, so this is a, from a web of science, um, looking at titles of uh, journal articles with carbon nanotube and either electronics, transistor, FET, diode, TFT or RF in the title. Um, so certainly this misses many um, papers published related to carbon nanotube electronics. Um, but gives a good snapshot of how the field has grown and um, and then slightly um, contracted um, in time. Um, so the field started with the first carbon nanotube transistor um, in 1998, uh, and then um, uh, it quickly grew uh, up to um, its largest um, largest state in around 2008, and then has um, uh, petered off just a little bit since then. Um, but the field is still growing very strong. And the, uh, the contributions to uh, the field of carbon nanotube electronics come from um, all over the world. Um, um, yeah, just about everywhere is, is contributing to this field. Um, so uh, first I want to uh, give some examples of light emitting devices um, fabricated from carbon nanotubes. Uh, so in this paper, it, um, it reports a electrically induced optical emission from a carbon nanotube FET. Um, so the idea is, is that one polarity of charge is being injected from, from one electrode of a single nanotube, and the other polarity of charge is being injected from the other. And there, the, two, the two charges are meeting, finding each other, forming what's called an exciton, which is a bound electron hole pair. And that uh, exciton is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking my drawings here, that exciton is uh, radiatively recombining to emit light, which is observed in this uh, infrared uh, camera image here. Uh, so this um, can be improved um, and has been improved by um, using multiple gates. Um, so to tune one injection um, and one charge carrier uh, on one side of the nanotube to um, electrons and the other to holes, and then this um, improves the um, efficiency. And this has also been improved by uh, tailoring of the contact metal um, to tune the Schottky barrier to better enable um, the injection of uh, electrons and holes, which we combined uh, to form exons and emit light. Um, a, uh, some newer work in the field is examining um, 
uh, not light emission from exciton states in copper nanotubes, but light emission from uh, what's called a polariton state, which is a hybrid uh, particle um, combining character of both microcavity photon and exciton. Uh, and what's really interesting about uh, exciton photon polaritons is you can you could tune the the emission energy um, from these cavities over significant ranges, which is what's shown in this work here. Um, and um, the polariton physics um, are really dictating where this energy uh, is. And so uh, light emitting transistors here are made of networks. Um, same idea is, is electrons and holes are injected at opposite contacts. They form excitons, which decay into polaritons. States and uh, are emitted from the cavity at these polariton uh, modes. Uh, there's also a lot of work looking at making single photon emitters from um, carbon nanotubes. And in this work, um, single photon emission uh, was coupled with a photonic circuit, uh, which is shown over here. And um, they, the authors report the observation of anti-bunching uh, in the light electrically uh, driven, uh, emitted by nanotubes and electrically driven by um, from nanotubes. And uh, single photon emission is is important for quantum uh, communications um, type devices and, and technologies. <clears throat> uh, another type of device uh, that uh, you'll see in literature quite often is, is um, a light detecting device. Um, so this paper here shows that by using dual gates um, to form a PN junction um, and in reverse bias that when a nan this nanotube absorbs uh, light that generating this electron and hole that the, the built-in field that exists produced by having these two different gates can separate the charges um, between the uh, to, to different sides of the device, resulting in a, um, a current uh, at zero volts or a um, or power. Um, so just, just kind of like a silicon solar cell might, uh, although this is a really, really small version of it because there's just one carbon nanotube in this uh, type of device. Um, other work has looked at making PN junctions from films of aligned nanotubes. Um, and here this work is, is creating uh, infrared um, detectors um, you, uh, via a photothermal effect um, by, um, uh, by, by creating these PN junctions in thin films of nanotubes. Uh, so this is work from my group where we've created type 2 heterojunctions between uh, carbon nanotubes and C60 fullerenes. Uh, there's a conduction band offset right at the interface between the two materials that's greater than the exciton binding energy. And so any exciton that exists near this interface will split where the electron here, which is transferred to the C60. And you can see that at zero volts, you get a, a large photocurrent, and at zero currents, you get a large the voltage and everywhere in this fourth quadrant of this diodes curve you get power conversion and so we've made um, devices where right where the nanotube absorbs at its optical band gap you can convert over 40 percent of the incident photons into uh, collected electronal pairs and we've made solar cells where the primary semiconductor absorbing is the nanotube that are around one percent power conversion efficient limited by the length scale over which these excitons can move around in these nanotube films um, Nanotubes have been used in other types of solar cells as a transparent conductor. Um, here, the, it's not the semiconducting property of nanotubes that's being uh, leveraged, but rather the, um, the good transparency in conductivity. And um, silicon nanotube cells have been made, and, and more recent work has looked at silicon perovskite cells. And there are uh, lots of great papers in the field in this topic. Um, I'm moving on away from optoelectronics, um, nanotube field effect transistors have been investigated in, in many different ways for sensors and biosensors. Uh, typical approaches are you uh, tether an antibody to a nanotube or here an aptamer to a nanotube and then um, binding of um, the analyte that you want to detect to the antibody or aptamer is detected by a shift in the threshold voltage or change in the conductivity of the nanotube that you can very sensitively measure because nanotube uh, because that binding might change the electrostatics of the environments and change the um, amount of charge in the nanotube or threshold voltage of the nanotube transistor, uh, resulting in a change in the current. And this effect has been used to measure um, even the um, dynamics of single molecules that can stick to nanotubes um, over time. Uh, so getting now into field effect transistors, 
um, uh, some, some early work from 2003 showed that um, when the channel length of a nanotube is less than this mean free path, you could get this ballistic transport that I mentioned earlier. And when you have ballistic transports, all the, or most of the resistance is at the contacts, and there's hardly any uh, resistance along the length of the nanotube. Uh, and the theoretical minimum resistance, or, um, yeah, theoretical minimum resistance is inversely related to the quantum capacitance, uh, where this is two quantum capacitance units. Um, and so in this work here, uh, at room temperature, the on states, which is at negative gate voltage over here, achieves uh, around 40% of this um, theoretical uh, limit. So showing that most of the resistance of this device is coming from contacts with very little scattering in, in the device. Um, so single nanotube transistors have been scaled to very small dimensions. Um, so silicon um, logic transistors have channel lengths on the order of 10 nanometers or, or shorter, you know, moving forward. Um, and so exploring the behaviors of nanotubes in this regime this is, has been very important to understand the potential of nanotubes in future technologies. Uh, so this work here showed that um, um, at, 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 at sub 10 nanometer channel length, that it's possible using nanotubes to achieve um, more than four times the, the current per width, where the width is the diameter of the nanotube, using a nanotube at, at a very low voltage than, than silicon. Uh, so this work uh, is similar in that it explored very small channel lengths, but it, it extended, the, um, extended the work by looking at both um, hole and electron conducting transistors, um, showing that, um, the, that these nanotubes can be switched on to achieve large currents at, at fairly small voltages, and that um, it's still possible to achieve very good subthreshold swings near um, near kind of like the theoretical max, uh, the theoretical optimum of 60, not optimum, but minimum of 60 MeV per decade. Uh, so there's been a, a work on extrapolating the measured performance from these uh, very small short channel transistors to uh, analyze what might happen if you have arrays of nanotubes. And again, you need arrays of nanotubes and transistors because you can't get enough current through a single nanotube um, to, to, to kind of uh, compensate for all the parasitic uh, resistances and capacitances in a circuit. So you need more nanotubes um, with a pitch around 5 to 10 nanometers. And so using the single nanotube data, um, uh, it's been, you could predict then extrapolate head performance. You could, uh, and in here, you're really comparing energy per transition for switching events versus the number of transitions per second possible. And this is comparing silicon up here to carbon nanotubes down here. So you see at the same, the same performance, uh, you could switch nanotube transistors at lower, array transistors at lower um, energy per transition, or at the same energy per, per transition, you could switch them at a higher um, number of switches per second. Uh, so uh, similar extrapolation of these complementary transistors at five nanometer uh, gate lengths were, were made in, th in that paper that I referred to a couple slides ago. Um, looking at the energy delay product. Um, so this is um, looking at a parameter that simultaneously um, characterizes how well you could do in terms of power per switching events versus delay between switching events um, where, where you sacrifice one versus the other. So looking at the product is really um, important. And this shows that the uh, carbon nanotubes can do better than silicon in terms of delay and uh, decreasing this energy delay product meaning you could switch nanotubes at faster speed at the constant energy per switching events, or that you can use less power uh, at a constant number of switching events per time. Um, so that, so you, you could achieve um, this higher energy or this superior energy delay product um, by about a factor of 10 relative to silicon devices with the same gate length as the conclusion of this paper. Uh, so this work analyzed the extrapolation of what might be possible if you are able to create um, nanotube transistors, either in memory or um, um, or other types of layers, uh, on top of other nanotube or silicon transistors. Um, this is really where nanotube's advantage is huge over silicon in that you can um, de potentially deposit nanotubes at room temperature, um, whereas single crystal silicon is very difficult to deposit on top of um, 
other existing transistors made of single crystal silicon. And so the, the advantage is, is really pretty substantial here. Um, and this, this extrapolation predicts that um, a thousand times improvement in energy delay products could be possible using nanotubes in 3D layered architectures. So really exciting stuff. Um, so that the, the challenge with making arrays of, of nanotubes um, is that so far, arrays of nanotubes that have been created in literature, the transistors made from them, don't quite match the um, extrapolation of what, from single nanotubes um, of what should be possible. Um, and reasons for that are heterogeneity. Every nanotube has the potential to be different. Um, it's difficult just aligning and placing nanotubes. And just aligning and placing them like what's shown down here is not enough. You have to control the pitch in order to make good contacts to the tubes and, and limit crosstalk effects, um, such as the crosstalk effects highlighted in this paper here. Uh, so the um, pursuit of, of arrays has really um, been dictated by how good are our, our, our methods for forming um, aligned arrays of nanotubes. And there's, there's different approaches being investigated in the field right now. Um, one is CVD on um, miscut quartz. The advantage there is the tubes are really high quality and they're really well aligned. Um, they're typically at a little bit lower density than you'd want. And there might be um, some metallic tubes in there, even in the best, um, even more than you'd want, uh, um, even in, in the state of the art syntheses that can grow primarily semiconducting nanotubes. Um, it's possible to align nanotubes by langmuir schafer and langmuir blodgett type approaches. Um, it's possible to filter nanotubes in aligned arrays. Uh, challenges here are density control. Um, so density by both of these methods is typically too high, more than this pitch of 5 to 10 nanometers between nanotubes. So really the ideal pitch um, for nanotube array transistor is somewhere in the intermediate regime. Too few nanotubes, you don't have enough current. Too many nanotubes. And they all start touching each other. You get these hybridization effects and, and bad contacts potentially to those nanotubes. Um, evaporation is another way of coaxing nanotubes to line up on substrates. Again, there, controlling the packing density and having too high of a packing density are, is a common problem, a common challenge. Um, it's possible to shear solutions of nanotubes to, to quasi align them, um, like what's shown here, but the alignment is not quite good enough for, for high performance transistors. Uh, big nanotubes can be aligned with dielectrophoresis. Um, this is um, works works uh, pretty well in some cases, um, but the challenges are density control and maximizing the degree of alignment. Um, one clever approach that's been investigated for taking CVD tubes that might be a, a, a really well aligned and really high quality, but but might be at a, a fairly low density, is to transfer them from the growth substrate um, onto an elastomer that then is contracted, and uh, multiplying the density. A very clever approach. Um, I think there's still questions about scalability and um, ease of implementing this technique in a, in a commercial uh, setting. Um, then there's a lot of work on placing nanotubes and using chemical patterns or trenches. Uh, here, the challenge is achieving a very high yield of individual tube placement and precision in the placement. Um, some really exciting work recently um, that has come out towards this end is the use of uh, DNA nano trenches to drive assembly. Um, so here, um, these these nano trenches are programmed to dock um, DNA wrapped nanotubes. And here we see that the nanotubes are being deposited in these trenches with a yield of around 95% with uh, excellent alignment. And uh, transistors have been made from these aligned arrays uh, by removing a lot of this DNA nano trench, uh, which is insulating, and then fabricating uh, top gates and electrode and depositing electrodes and so forth on top of those um, uh, nanotube arrays um, with with fairly decent performance. Uh, so other recent work on forming arrays has utilized a solvent interface to induce assembly. Um, so in this work here, um, a dimension limited self alignment approach is used to deposit nanotubes aligned within nine degrees at packing densities of 100 to 200 nanotubes per micrometer of our wafer scale. Uh, and uh, really excellent transistor characteristics are shown with on-state currents that are uh, very high and high transconductances and um, uh, overall, overall really uh, appealing uh, performance. Um, other work has used solvent-solvent interfaces to induce self-assembly. Um, so this is work in which I've participated and my group has participated. Um, so FESA, Floating Evaporative Self-Assembly, uh, takes organic um, 
dispersions or dispersions of uh, polymer wrap nanotubes and organic solvent and disperses them on the water, water subface. And the droplets spread, leaving stripes of aligned nanotubes. Uh, these stripes of aligned nanotubes have been used to create transistors with very high uh, current density um, that are at low source strain bias, um, quasi ballistic. So each nanotube in the array is able to demonstrate nearly ballistic transport in, in parallel. Uh, just like single nanotube transistors um, can do. But here, um, this is being achieved on, on, with many nanotubes at the same time in the same device. Um, uh, a newer uh, bit of research out of uh, my lab has been led by uh, Dr. Catherine Jenkins, who's, who's now at Northwestern University. And she'll be giving a presentation at the NT21 conference on Monday uh, morning at 10.45 Houston time. And her work has shown that it's possible to form a two-dimensional liquid crystal of nanotubes at the interface of water and an organic solvent. So the nanotubes get pulled out of the uh, organic solvent. They accumulate at this interface between the two solvents. And there, at sufficiently high concentration, they become self-aligned due to 2D liquid crystallinity. Uh, and uh, what you see here in this SEM are nanotubes aligned um, in these domains. And then by flowing um, through a narrow channel of the organic solvents, you can shear induce all these uh, very low shears, all the domains to get single orientation um, on macroscopic areas of aligned nanotubes. And so here, uh, Catherine has demonstrated this on a 10 centimeter uh, wafer piece, uh, and she's made um, transistors with, with very high currents at, uh, at uh, 0.6 volts, 110 nanometer channel length, and very re reproducible um, on state currents and characteristics as you move from spot to spot in the wafer. Uh, so nanotube networks are perhaps the most mature um, in terms of processing. Uh, nanotube networks, um, there's so many papers here, I don't have time to review all of them, but this is very two, two nice review articles on, that have large sections of the review articles devoted to talking about nanotube electronics. And we have um, a figure from one of these papers here showing that the, uh, the different methods that can be used to make networks. So we have CVD growth, uh, we have dry filtra filtration, evaporative self-assembly, spin coating, drop casting, printing, spraying. Um, many methods um, have, have been studied for creating networks of nanotubes. Um, so the networks are often limited by tube-tube contact resistance, but still very attractive mobilities can be achieved compared to other thin film transistor materials. Um, and because of these techniques for depositing and creating these networks are not really more mature than, say, the techniques that have been developed for depositing aligned arrays of nanotubes or individualizing individual tubes. Um, the, this field is perhaps the closest to commercialization because, because it's possible to make over large areas very uniform um, networks. And so this excellent uniformity, in fact, uh, was exploited in, uh, to create a modern microprocessor from, um, from networks of carbon nanotubes. Uh, so in this paper, which was published a couple of years ago now, uh, a beyond silicon microprocessor is demonstrated, built entirely from nanotube FETs, um, from 14,000 complementary metal oxide semiconductor nanotube FETs, using um, industry standard processes. All right, so the, to conclude the talk in the fourth part of um, this tutorial, um, briefly I want to touch on my perspective on what fundamental research is needed to make nanotube electronics commercially competitive and viable. All right, so thin film networks um, for large area, flexible, stretchable microelectronics and so forth, um, they really do outcompete many existing materials in terms of performance. Um, in t compared to aligned arrays, as I was just saying, the uniformity and reproducibility are, are much superior, um, but, there are, but still yield, reproducibility, and uniformity are significant challenges. Um, displacing existing materials might be difficult because the scale is so uh, large and uniformity is so good with these existing materials. And quick, the quickest route to adoption is likely to be in, in new applications uh, rather than trying to displace materials in existing ones. In terms of making uh, microelectronic devices using aligned nanotubes, um, which is really my passion in, in my research group right now, um, obtaining, we've shown and other groups have shown that obtaining high current density, low off currents, good sub threshold swing, these are all possible using arrays, um, but uh, not yet with the incredibly high uniformity, reproducibility, and yield needed by industry. Um, so for example, nanotube density variation from transistor to transistor will lead to um, on-current polydispersity. 
the nanotube nanotube interactions or channel uh, crossing in the channel could lead to hyper uh, could lead to crosstalk effects and off current polydispersity a change in how well the gate can can control the charge density in each tube um, at the crossing point. Um, any threshold voltage polydispersity from nanotube to nanotube will blur out the um, characteristics where they sw switching from on to off, resulting in effectively worse subthreshold swing and subthreshold swing degradation. So the, really the field, in my opinion, needs to work more on overcoming material science and processing challenges for how to deposit, grow, align, transfer nanotubes uniformly to overcome these variations. Uh, we need to ultimately learn how to make the semiconducting carbon nanotube wafer in a way that uh, is, uh, meets the stringent needs of industry. And then we need to learn how to do this if we want to take advantage of these um, 3D integration ideas. We need to learn how to deposit nanotubes on top of other nanotube uh, FETs with, with um, equally high yield. Um, so uh, in conclusion, we need, in my opinion, we need the carbon nanotube wafer. We need films, networks, arrays of nanotubes with a uniformity uh, and reproducibility of silicon and other conventional electronic materials. And so um, in, in conclusion, um, nanotubes are uh, exciting materials for electronics. There's just been immense progress made in the last 20 years. There are still significant challenges remaining. Um, I hope that many of you um, are able to solve these challenges and keep pushing the field forward. And uh, it really, it's one of my lifelong dreams is to see carbon nanotube electronics uh, actually make it actually work. And it'll take all of us working together to make that possible. So thank you very much. Um, hope to all see you in person uh, sometime soon.